Welcome to Safer Journeys, a podcast dedicated to raising children, ending violence, and ending oppression. We're your hosts. I'm Melissa. I am the Director of Community Engagement with Safe Journeys here in Streeter, Illinois. And I am Heather. I'm a preventionist here. I work under Melissa. And we have one of our dearest friends back again, Stephanie. Welcome. Thank you for coming back. Hi, thank you so much for having me back. I'm so excited to do this episode with you all as well. And I am a redeploy caseworker. I work with juvenile delinquents, keeping them out of incarceration and helping them to transition into our communities. And I work with the Youth Service Bureau in Peru. Yeah, um, we actually do a lot of stuff together. We're not the same agencies, but we do so much of the same work. So we really are very lucky that we get to have such an amazing um, partner and friend in our work here. Yes. Yes. And it's invaluable being able to connect the work that we do and share that, their resources and our resources, and just create more safe grownups in the lives of kids who need them. So that's right. Perfect. And speaking of safe grown-ups, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> let's talk about ACEs today. So we mentioned it super briefly at the end of our last podcast, uh, or our last episode. So ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. You've probably heard this if you are in the mental health field, social work, something of that nature. You've definitely heard about ACEs. So ACEs is essentially trauma. Sometimes it's referred to as toxic stress. And this is toxic stress that occurs during childhood. And we're talking about zero to 17 years old here. And ACEs was developed for a CDC and Kaiser Permanente study. And this study has since been updated. Yeah, they're constantly like, I don't want to say redoing the study, but they're updating it because things change, right? This originally, this was, gosh, I should have looked this up. It's been a while since it's been started. So constantly updating. Um, A few things to note, this is ACEs are common. If you happen to go online and take the ACEs test and you find you have a high score, please don't freak out. Um, We are going to help you cope with that in this episode. Um, Yeah, let's play a little sound clip here from Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. She's the Surgeon General of California. This is from one of her TED Talks about ACEs. In the mid-90s, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente discovered an exposure that dramatically increased the risk for 7 out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States. In high doses, it affects brain development, the immune system, hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Folks who are exposed in very high doses have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer and a 20-year difference in life expectancy. Oof, right? That's a lot. That's heavy. Yeah. That's a lot of impact on an individual. (laughs) This might be our good spot for a trigger warning, huh? (laughs) Right. Yes. Trigger warning. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So again, we're going to be talking about trauma um, and adverse life experiences. So please be sure to take care of yourself. Um, If you need to stop halfway, do that. If you need to just not listen, that's great too. Yeah. You can turn it right off right now. Mm -hmm. So any thoughts on that clip, y'all? Yeah. Okay. I just want to, can I describe their faces right now, please? <laughs> their eyes both just like got real big and they just kind of made those like, oh, how am I even supposed to talk about this face? So, yeah, it's just so much that we don't think about when we think about trauma, when we think about our childhoods, that the things that are happening within our homes, within our communities can have that dramatic of effect on our lives and our futures. 20 year difference yeah, like in life, life expectancy, expectancy, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. That's just like a gut punch. Mm-hmm. It really is. And and she like only briefly mentioned some of the things that could happen to our bodies, but there's a lot of stuff that could happen that could quote unquote go wrong as a result of experiencing some of these very stressful um, events in life. So w- 
when we talk about ACEs, there's a lot, we tend to break them down into different categories, um, like what kind of adverse experience you had. So Melissa, why don't you just talk a little bit about the, for the individual person? Right. So for the individual, there's physical, psychological, or sexual abuse that can impact someone adversely. Um, Having no or limited friends, isolation really impacts a person. Not being around people, not having pro-social people around you. And I'll talk a little bit in a a second. Well, actually in the next episode very Mm -hmm. much so. Well, tell everybody what pro-social is because that's, I think, maybe something we say in our field, but not everyone understands or knows what it means. Right. So, People around you that have coping skills, that have the ability to put themselves outside of their own mind and take on the perspective of another person, empathize, um, anything like that. So essentially, like positive role models, positive influences who know how to cope and can pass those skills on to the people in their lives and kind of model that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, So I wanted to mention about isolation, like if you've been paying any attention to the news on like aging um, and health development, we, what we, the science community, (laughs) me all by myself (laughs) have figured this out. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you so much. Uh, Yeah, I know I'm fixing the world's problems. It's not a big deal. (laughs) Um, But we, again, oh my gosh. Okay. The science community has discovered, I mean, they probably already knew, but they have actual evidence to support that isolation and loneliness is a huge factor in quality of life and length of life in our older folks. And of course, in younger people as well. But we're seeing some of the actual physical data coming out of studying aging and isolation. So, so uh, family, right? We, if we live with your family, they're obviously going to have an impact. Could be good, could be bad. Usually it's something in the middle. There's some good and some a bad, right? A little from column A and a little from column B. <laughs> and then that weird gray in the middle column, right? So some things, just basic economic hardship is considered an adverse um, life experience or an ACE, right? And I'm thinking, you know, maybe you can't go to your friend's house because mom or dad doesn't have enough money for gas. Maybe you're on um, state aid for health insurance. Maybe you get food stamps. Maybe you're living in public housing. Anything that's going to mean that your family has to work a little bit harder to get or to purchase the things that they need to purchase. Right. And this might impact extracurricular activities as well for children, because if you don't have a ride to or from Mm -hmm. um, and and your school isn't providing some after school program where they are also uh, providing a ride back from said school to either your home or another common location that could that would be easier to pick up from, then (laughs) what happens for the child, like they're left out. They're not getting as much attention and opportunity as the children around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Heather, you mentioned like being on food stamps and different things like that. If a child is not able to have that food security in the household because of economic reasons, then it's going to impact their ability to learn, their ability to play and grow the way that their peers are growing and learning when they have access to those things easier. That's right. Yeah. And actually in the last episode, we mentioned how taking care of your body and nutrition, right? It affects your overall mental well-being. So if, I don't know how many of you have gone to the grocery store, but it's a lot cheaper to buy the junk food, right? Than it is to buy the highly nutritional meals. So if you're living on food stamps, you're buying for quantity, not quality most of the time. So a lot of the young people aren't getting their nutritional needs met as well. And then I also wanted to mention something in the family structure that could cause some stress that a lot of times we don't mention. And that's what if one of your caregivers is incarcerated? I had a young person in my previous position who watched his parent um, be arrested and their house searched for drugs, right? And and now he needs some support from social services. And like, that wasn't the only event in his life that caused some distress, but it, you know, it's hard on kiddos. And then now 
his dad's gone out of his life for however many years. And that's a lot of stress. And I think there's probably some shame and there's stigma associated with it as well. And kids could also lose caregivers for other reasons, right? Uh, Freak accidents, of course, significant illnesses, even not losing a caregiver, but them having a chronic illness or an illness that severely impacts their ability to function, right? Like if your mom or your dad has severe terminal cancer, they're not going to be able to help you with their homework. Um, They're not going to be there to be able to support you through stuff the same way because they're just trying to stay alive. Right. And what I see a lot in those kinds of situations too is the child themselves having to become a caregiver because they're the only person there who can do those things. And when you talk about parents being incarcerated, that's something that I also see really common in my work is that My kiddos who are involved with the juvenile justice system have a history of parents being involved with the juvenile justice system, and that comes down to impact them because that's what they've grown up seeing because of the hardships that have been created in their lives because of that. Yeah. Gosh, that's I hate hearing that. I know it's true. I just hate hearing about it. And given Melissa and my um, profession, we can't not talk about the effects of witnessing violence in the home. So potentially um, a child watching their parents um, fight with each other. And I'm not talking about like mm, their parents had a disagreement about dinner or something. I, I mean like significant fighting that happens regularly and not just physical. It could be emotional as well. Um, yeah, it has a really negative impact on these young people. That's right. Um, we talked a little bit about generational trauma, too, on our previous episode. And I may, can I bump this one over to you, Stephanie? Can, we, can you talk about how generational trauma in a parent or a caregiver could cause trauma in a young person? Absolutely. Um, generational trauma is a big one for me. I love talking about this topic, informing people about this topic, because I don't think that individuals always know the impact that they can have on their children and their whole generational line. Because if you have a parent who never learned how to cope, who grew up in an abusive household, and all they learned was when your child's not listening to you, you hit them. And so that's how they parent. And then that child grows up and what do they see? What do they learn? When when someone doesn't listen to you, you hit them. And so they go to school and they hit a peer because the kid wasn't listening to them. And well, now they've got a juvenile record and they're a part of the court system and they've made this reputation for themselves. And once you're involved in the juvenile justice system, it's so easy to stay in the juvenile justice system because you're familiar with those peers. You're running with the wrong crowd. And now you've got a child and you're involved in the system. You've only learned to solve your problems by hitting by using violence and now that's the environment that this new generation is growing up in and it just creates this cycle so you have so much power as one individual person when you take on your own healing to heal the rest of the line for your family and to stop that kind of trauma in its tracks really I've heard on social media um, people referring to those individuals as cycle breakers. Yes, Mm -hmm. that is how I love to define myself, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, So I shared on the previous episode, I'm sure I'll share a lot on this episode, that I'm not shy about talking about my own trauma history. And I like to think of myself as a cycle breaker because I did realize the impact that trauma continued to have on my family and on previous generations. And I was able to say, it stops with me and I'm going to parent differently. I'm going to do it differently and change things. So. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I know. I love it so much. And I want to like call up your kids and be like, I hope you know how amazing your mother is. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then they'll tell you that I didn't let them walk yeah. the dog to the bus stop this morning and I'm actually the worst. Yep. So don't bother. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> stinkers. What stinkers? <laughs> so there are community level um, 
childhood experiences as well. And in the last episode, we started to mention this about uh, witnessing violence, community violence, gun violence, um, natural disasters. Let's say um, a child is a refugee. That's going to impact them. Let's say they have witnessed war. Um, even that there's war right in there yeah. happening in their town and they hear the the shots and in like in their sleep and yeah. like it's going to impact them it's making me think about the young people in ukraine at yes. the moment yes absolutely yeah. so i'm sure you're getting the idea there's a lot of different ways um, that you could experience an adverse childhood experience or ace right So I do want to touch on some of the negative um, health wellness outcomes that um, Dr. Burke, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, I believe it was, um, mentioned as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about risky uh, behaviors again. (laughs) Yes. So we just want to name some of those as smoking, substance and alcohol use, and risky sexual behaviors. And I do want to say... Um, These are just, these are ways of coping with something. It might not be the best way, but it's the way that they've figured out how to deal with it at the time. Yeah, maybe they watch their parents or caregivers or older siblings deal with their stress in a similar way. Yeah, that's right. And um, and then another outcome could be um, poorer mental health. And again, it's it's because of the way that they know how to cope with this thing. Mm-hmm. So there are higher rates of suicide for individuals who have um, higher ACEs and depression and anxiety and PTSD, which was um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yep. Stephanie, anything before I head on to the next one? I think I said this in the previous episode and I just want to echo it here is that I see so many of those risky behaviors being used by the youth that I work with because it is how they've learned how to cope or it's the only coping skill that's working for them. I hear a lot of my clients who struggle with addiction say it just helps me not to feel it anymore. I don't want to feel anything and this is the only way. And so, again, that sometimes gets them labeled as bad kids, but they're just coping kids. Yeah, I I always feel a little bit grumpy when I hear people discriminating against or some sort of stigma against individuals using substances or misusing or abusing, however you want to, you know, addiction, that kind of thing. Because most of these people, are that was their only go-to. It was the only thing they had to survive a certain situation. So yeah, no, it's not healthy, right? Of course. But let's work on it now. Right. We don't, you're not a bad person. You didn't make a bad choice. You were presented with some really awful things. And then you were presented with a substance that could help you feel better temporarily. Why the heck would I or you have not tried to cope in such a way, right? Right. And perhaps it also had to do with the accessibility of things that could have helped them that they, there were barriers or Mm -hmm. obstacles in place that they couldn't even access those things like counseling, Mm -hmm. like, um, like a support group or, or even just like a a friend group that had more pro-social behaviors. Like sometimes that's just completely inaccessible for them. Oh, totally. I mean, and then when you said that, the, they didn't have access to things. I'm thinking, oh, I bet a lot of these people who have severe anxiety and can't get to a doctor or their health insurance stinks. So those like $500 a month anti-anxiety meds are just not an option for them. Right. But they can go purchase, you know, an illegal substance for 20 bucks down the street. Right. right? Like they're literally, they're doing the best that they can. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, society accepts um, mental health um, medication, right? As a way for us to, to cope. And, and yeah, I mean, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I take mental health medication. Me too. Um, and <laughs> totally, totally <laughs> talking <laughs> up here. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Um, Lexapro's my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Bupropion over here, yeah. All right, I guess <laughs> I better tell you I'm on Effexor. <laughs> like, if we're going to go name all of our uh, mental health medication. <laughs> this is now a support group. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it kind of is, to be fair. It really is. But, I mean, and then all of a sudden, you know, Let's say it's a substance that uh, the 
the law or the police like look down upon and then they're getting what arrested for even having it and that's the way they've been coping that's what they can access so and now they've got a label on top of it they're trying right. to cope and now they've got a label because what kind of like struck me was we were able to sit here and we were able to laugh about that and just because society lets us but mm-hmm. for people who don't have that same level of privilege that same level of access they can't even openly talk about their coping skills. They can't right. do those sorts of things because it's not accepted. And this is why we have Stephanie on the podcast because she brings up these really important things that, yes. truthfully, I wasn't thinking about that. I no. wish I was. I know. <laughs> but you were too busy, like, solving science. Oh, right, right, right. Because I, yep, so. yep, yep, my bad. <laughs> Speaking of science, <laughs> you may also learn as you listen to these episodes, I'm a science nerd. So yes. I'm going to just embrace it. So give us more science. Yeah, I'm going to. <laughs> so what other negative health impacts? Um, we can talk about some of those chronic health conditions. ACEs, the more you have the, or the higher your ACEs score, the more likely you're going to experience some of these negative health outcomes. Again, we heart disease. Yep. Um, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's just a different kind of heart disease. Um, Diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases. And I'm only listing ones that we have like a bunch of evidence to support. I am pretty darn sure there are a lot of other things, conditions and health out negative health outcomes that we just haven't been able to do the research on just yet. Yeah. And I would say, too, some of this um, at the community level of adverse childhood experiences, I would even say like the environment and like air quality, water quality absolutely, and how that impacts chronic health conditions. Because I was listening to this and I'm thinking like, oh, cancer, uh, the the COPD, right? Um, a lot of times. Like, let's say somebody was in the mining community, right? Like, they're going to be facing some some things having to do with their lungs. Yeah. And, um, and often you'll find those communities who, like, have lost a lot of income or, like, industry has left that space and moved to a different, like, like more city. Yeah. And, and now it's rural and so many people have been left behind, but they're, like, stuck with these chronic health conditions. And then now it's going to lead into what I'm going to say next, which is they're in these poor economic circumstances. And then – and and. This leads into what Stephanie was saying about generational trauma, because then you get stuck in this cycle of not really being able to get out um, unless there's some kind of cycle breaker, right? Which, um, unfortunately, with the poor economic circumstances... It's way harder to be that cycle breaker. Absolutely. You're struggling for money. Yeah. There's more barriers Mm -hmm. to educational attainment. There's more barriers to unemployment. And especially if you're dealing with a chronic health condition, how in the world would you be able to keep a job? Yes, it is absolutely easier said than it is done. There are so many barriers in place and so many things that you don't think about that would prohibit you from breaking those kind of cycles. When you were talking, Melissa, about the environmental factors, um, something that I learned when I was, I did an internship in inner city St. Louis and um, African-American children are actually more prone to having asthma because they're more prone to growing up in locations where there's poor air quality. And so then parents are taking off of work because they've got chronically ill children who have asthma. They can't make money. They can't move out of the inner city and they're stuck. And so it's so much more that we don't always think about that goes into breaking these cycles and getting out of these experiences. Yeah, no, that's, that's powerful in in a not really good way. Uh So With ACEs, there are some populations that are experiencing higher ACEs scores or more at risk for experiencing these adverse um, life events. And as a whole, it's marginalized groups. I mean, anytime, what's your, what's your saying, Melissa, about marginalized, the boundaries of the boundaries or the oh margins of the margins the margins of the margins yeah. yes that's what it is and like I have a visual I uh, you know in my mind when you see that so that's why I wanted to make sure you mentioned it Thank um you. but yeah so essentially a marginalized group is any group of individuals who have been have 
access to certain things withheld from them, with certain resources, valuable, important resources that they don't, they're unable to access for a variety of different reasons. So like people of color, um, LGBTQIA folks, um, Stephanie's young folks who have been in the juvenile justice system, um, kiddos who have been in foster care, people in general who have experienced um, victimization in some way, all of those things make that individual part of a marginalized group. Yeah, and I would also add individuals with intellectual and developmental oh, disabilities. Yep. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Physical, dis I mean, they're honest, the list just goes oh, on yes. and on. Yes. Um, but these marginalized groups not only have less access to resources, they also have more barriers and obstacles to get to those resources. It's like you, they, the society we live in has doubled down yes. on keeping those people in the margins of the margin. Oh, absolutely. Otherwise, we could actually accomplish equity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we could. <laughs> I think we would need to abolish pretty much every structure. Oh, yeah. And start from start scratch. Start from the ground. Yep, yeah. Yep. yeah. I mean, I'd love to. I, I doubt that's going to happen in my lifetime, but that would be very helpful. I mean, we could have some healing circles and then we could some have restorative some listening justice sessions. practices, <laughs> right? Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. <laughs> oh, you're fine. <laughs> Absolutely, on the restorative justice practices. Yes, look it up, folks. Yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll talk about restorative justice on another episode. Oh yeah, yeah, no, we for sure will. <laughs> Can you tell um, our listeners about taking the ACEs test? I don't like the word test, but yeah. So there's assessment. ten total questions, and they're yes or no questions. You get one point for every yes, and the higher score means there are more negative outcomes. Right. So it's out of 10. If you had a nine out of 10, those are some pretty severe uh, negative outcomes that you could be experiencing. That's right. But it's it's not taking into effect the resilience factors, though. So which is what I love. And I'm so excited that we're transitioning to that resilience factor part of the conversation. Um, I always joke, I'm putting that in air quotes with people who understand the ACEs and understand that assessment. I always joke, I'm a 10 out of 10 on the ACEs score. Like yeah. I get a hundred percent in trauma guys. Like Good I'm job, an Stephanie. overachiever. Gold stars. <laughs> yes. I love my gold stars, but, um, that's accurate. And so for me, after hearing all of the information about the negative impacts that, having that kind of trauma can have on your life. Like I want the same 20 years everybody else gets it to their life. I don't want to miss out on that. So after hearing all of that and knowing that I score 100% in trauma, I love talking about protective factors and resiliency because that's the hope of the conversation. That's the place where all of those things can kind of come out in the wash. And we can see that even though we have those ACEs and those tra traumatic experiences, that there's hope on the other side and there are things that we can do to kind of mitigate some of that. Yes. And Stephanie, thank you for that snapshot of what we're going to be talking about next episode when we talk about resilience and protective factors and resistance. Resilience oh, as yeah, you're resistance. You're so good. At, I always forget, but that's honestly become one of my favorite. Um, do you want, do you want to give a quick little couple sentences about it. You don't have to. Well, let's let's save it for okay, next let's episode. Save it, let's I save am it. excited though. And um, I just want to say, just reiterate, children and adults with higher scores on the ACEs scale are not doomed. Um, with the right support, we can still thrive. Yes. I am still here with yes. my A plus in trauma and I'm <laughs> doing just fine. So. I would say Stephanie's doing more than just fine. I think so. A plus, plus, plus. Killing it. <laughs> She's a freaking amazing mom, a great partner, a good friend, social. Like, I could just go on and on. Yes. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. And she's put in a lot of work to get to this place. Yeah, it takes a lot of work, but it also takes a lot of that resiliency and protective factors. And so I'm just so excited for you all to hear about those things on a different episode and hear the hope part of the trauma conversation. Yes. Now I'm going to bring it down. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm always the one who brings in with the negative stuff. I was like, but did you know? Let me share some research. With yeah, you. let me <laughs> let me share some data. Um, don't reach out to my husband because this is his like number one least favorite thing that I do. It's like, well, studies show. 
Um, but studies do show some things. And one of those things is um, that childhood trauma is a huge public health problem. Um, I'm going to rattle off a few numbers here. Uh, if we were to say manage this childhood trauma to a much better degree, what might that look like? Well, we could prevent 1.9 million cases of heart disease. Whoa. We're gonna, those cardiac care nurses would be out of a job. Um, we could also prevent 2.5 million cases of obesity. And obesity in itself isn't the issue. It's the health stuff that can sometimes be associated with it. We could also, and this one's a huge one, ready? We could reduce the cases of depression by 21 million people. That's incredible. Wow. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I keep thinking like all of the counselors and therapists are just so booked out, right? Like when yes. you try <laughs> to make an appointment, it's four or five months in advance. Yes. If we reduce depression by this level, 21 million, we'd actually be able to get into our counselors and therapists, right? <laughs> um, and then additionally... We could keep 1.5 million young people in school. So rather than dropping out, we could have a high school graduation for 1.5 million students. And this is just the United States, guys. This is not the world. Imagine the world if we could oh, yeah. significantly reduce childhood trauma. And if we back up to our negative health and wellness outcomes, right? Like if you graduate from high school, your ability to attain more education increases. Yep. Your ability to get employment that is meaningful for you and helps pay the bills and not have to have like two plus jobs yeah. um, in order to pay for groceries and, and still be running around trying to make ends meet. Um, it, it just helps all around. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's, that's really, those are really important statistics that you just shared. Thanks. Thanks for not um, nerd shaming me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Never. No nerd shaming here. I just like to joke about the science. It's it's, fun. Please continue to joke about it. It's, <laughs> it really doesn't upset me at all. Well, speaking of science, this week we are loving the media of um, the book called The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van, van der Kolk. Yeah, I know. It's it's a mouthful when I like I was like, ooh, Melissa's well, about to read that name. <laughs> um you. Stephanie, you've read this book, correct? Yes, I have. Yes. And what would you like to share with listeners about it? Oh my gosh. Um, if you can read it, read it. It will kind of change your outlook on your own personal trauma, the trauma of those that you meet. Um we talked a little bit um, in the last episode about my yoga practice yeah. and how that ended up being so revolutionary for me. And one of the reasons for that is trauma gets stored in your body. Your body can remember these events and it can put you in this constant fight or flight mode. And so you might not even cognitively, like in your brain, be thinking about, oh my gosh, that one time that thing happened, I'm so, I'm scared, I'm hypervigilant, but you are. And like, unless you can get that trauma out of your body, you're still going to keep responding to it. And so yoga is the way that I learned to get some of that trauma out of my body and start to really be in the moment and be in my body again. And it was just so helpful and revolutionary to changing my life and my relationship with trauma. Yeah, that was, I mean, that's a great promo for that book, right? Yes. Um, I do want to mention quickly that this was published in 2014, so it's about 10 years ago. So there are some new updates to it, but the core of it is still absolutely validated. Um, and most of the people in the world of child development, psychology, social work, um, all agree that this is an incredibly valuable book. It is super heavy. So... Just make sure that um, if you do consume this media, that um, you might want to take it in chunks or uh, just see, check in with yourself. See, how am I doing today? Is this media that I would want 
in in my mind today. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned last episode about the ways that I cope with things and and how I have to really watch what media I'm consuming. And so if I've already done quite a few things on trauma at work, I'm not going to want to just read this for um, fun or, you know, like it's not one of those books that it's like, oh, this is going to be a great, you know, escape. Like, no, no. (laughs) this is part of like emotional labor. So it is, it is. I actually, it took me, I think over six months to get through the book because I had to keep putting it down because I'd read a piece, identify it with it and really need to process it before I moved on to the next thing. So just keep those in mind. If you do um, read, you could also get the audiobook. I know that's a favorite of Melissa. She loves listening to audiobooks. I do in my car. Yeah, it's nice. But Thank you all so much for listening again. Thank you. Thank you a thousand times, Stephanie. Yes. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me and letting me be a part of this conversation. Um, If I can do a little tidbit, um, because I don't get to be on the resiliency episode and I want to talk about it so badly. Talk about it. Um, I just want to talk about how resiliency really plays a key factor in the work that I do with the youth that I serve. And it is just such rewarding work because you can watch the different support that you give make a difference in these kids' lives. I have seen kids who never went to school a day in their life, like literally truancy was called all the time they wouldn't go to school I've gotten to sit at their graduations and watch them graduate from eighth grade and then go on to high school and just so many cool things like that and so I just really want to be an advocate for being the safe grown-up in someone's life for being that resiliency piece and that protective factor because it's so rewarding for you and it also just makes a big difference in our world because that's one more kid who's in high school and will hopefully graduate high school and go on to do great amazing things that they were made to do so I think the progress that you see in your young people is a true testament to what great work you're doing well, thank you. you I appreciate it. You are so welcome. And you I make this community this a better place. Yeah. <laughs> I, I suspect you'll hear Stephanie again at some point here in the future. Yes. I really hope so. Yeah. I, you, I feel you pretty will. strongly about it that you will. <laughs> no hints, I guess, about the future there. Anyways, thank you again. Keep listening. We will tell you how to get a hold of us and where you can get some support if you need it. Thanks again. Keep an eye out for new podcasts that drop every other Monday. And you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, or anywhere else you might be listening to podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. So you can give us a shout at our email, saferjourneyspod at safejourneysillinois.com. You can also message us on Facebook or Instagram at our Safer Journeys podcast pages. If you need to reach out for domestic or sexual violence, Our Safe Journeys hotline supports people in Livingston, LaSalle County, located in North Central Illinois. And our support line number is 815-673-1555. For those of you out of our listening area, if you've experienced sexual violence and need to reach out to a support line, you can call RAIN with two N's at 1-800-656-HOPE. You can also reach out on their website and chat live. You may call the Domestic Violence Hotline if you've experienced or are experiencing domestic violence. It is simply called The Hotline. You can find them at thehotline.org where you can live chat on their website or you can give them a call at 1-800-799-SAFE.